welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast, sponsored by the National Association of Independent Artists. Also sponsored by Zapplication. I'm Will Armstrong, and I'm a mixed media artist. I'm Douglas Sigworth, glassblower. Join our conversations with professional working artists. Folks, it's podcast time once again. I'm back with the uh, lovely and talented Douglas Sigworth. How are you, sir? I am well. How are you? I'm doing fine, man. A little uh, stressed once again, okay. uh, trying to come down the home stretch on a big commission, but I'll get through it. Yeah, good, good, good. You're bearded. I can tell you haven't had a show in a while. Yeah, yep. I'm off the road, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I'm working on studio equipment. So, yeah, personal hygiene goes by the wayside in these situations. Just watch the nostril hair, folks, <laughs> and uh, watch the ponytail. You're a bald man, sir, so you don't have to worry about that as much. You keep it clean and tight, but... uh I used to joke that when I'd get salty and uh, cranky about art shows, I'd say, man, my ponytail's starting to grow in. (laughs) Old salt and pepper ponytail. You don't want to turn into an old crank. Bitter old crank. Bitter old cranks. That was the working title of the show for a few weeks anyway. Well, I'm actually on cloud nine. I've been in such a bad mood all week because of working in the studio on this equipment. But Mm. I had my pre-op appointment today, and my surgery is full steam ahead. They signed off. I'm in good enough shape. I can go under the knife. Once this airs, it'll be the day after tomorrow. Oh, my gosh. We've been talking about this for a while. Nine months. I've been dealing with this for nine freaking months, man. (laughs) Well, you've been dealing with it for a long time, and and, uh, the listeners have been dealing with it as well. Longer. (laughs) They've been dealing with it longer. Right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, it's – I I hope everything goes well. I'm sure it will. I'm I'm sure you're in in good hands. Are you going into – Madison, or or where do you where do you go for the surgery? Nope, just right here in town, just in Woodbury. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Well, this is kind of funny because you know I've been planning, as we know, and timing everything out, and I started to have this worry that I'm going to like get to this appointment that's supposed to you know make sure that I'm not going to die in a surgery, you know, to sign off on my health and everything. And I go in and I'm thinking, what if there's something that puts a hold on it? What if I can't go ahead in the time now that I want to do it? And they take my blood pressure, and it's freaking through the roof. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) They're like, do you have a little stress right now? And I'm like, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. So they checked me again before I left, and I was just fine. But, yeah, I didn't know your blood pressure could drop 20 points in the matter of five minutes or 10 minutes or something. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. All right. That's – wow. Yeah, that's a lot. That is a lot. Yeah, it's just a a little stress here and there, just a little bit. I think you like it. Is that true? You like living with a little bit of stress? I don't don't think I know any other way, honestly. Yeah. I think we wind ourselves up, and uh, I'm trying not to live with it, but good Lord. Yeah. seem to – catch myself right back in that cycle, that that art show cycle once again. So, Well, you know what yeah. really gets the old adrenaline up with you, Will, is mm. those big vehicles pulling into the sites. I think you have a story to tell us about that. Something about you're a big setting me up. You're softballing me. I, yeah, you're softballing me. <laughs> you know, I told you I had something I wanted to talk to you about before. It's, it's like I feel like it's Bill Maher, like his new rules. I feel like oh. here's here's a new rule for art shows. Yeah. If you can sleep in it, and I'm not talking about just like a lot of us, uh, a lot of us get out there on the road and they've got the, the cot in the back of the van sure, so that they yeah. can pull over and take a nap or save some money here and there. I'm not talking about these guys. Okay. I'm talking about if you can wash your dishes in it, Douglas. <laughs> All right. If you can do dishes, if you can refrigerate your food, okay. if it's, you know, if you can live in it comfortably, it's, if it's a residence, yeah. you got to wait. You got to fucking wait. <laughs> Just to you pull gotta, onto the site, you got to wait. Yeah, to pull onto the site. Yeah. You got to, you're last. <laughs> if you can live in it, you're last. That's the give and take. I thought That's it was the first in, last out, though, with the big vehicles. No. No. Get it. Just get it. I don't even want to see it. I don't want to see it. See it. I don't want to see you and your residents uh, pulling into the site. I was at uh, Plaza a few weeks back. I was setting up. It was a weird kind of window. We knew there was a lot of rain for setup and it was going to be beautiful for the rest of the weekend. Okay. You know, it's something about that kind of rain. You're not really that worried about it. Everybody's kind of low stress, but you're trying to get with it. You know, you're trying to be a little snappy and get things set up. My neighbors across the way, uh, glass artists, 2D glass artists, okay. actually. So uh, they were stained glass and they had everything up and hanging in their booth and everything was all set up and they had their awnings up and a residence came down the road and took a tight turn. Oh, no. And, 
Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. And uh, it hung up on their RV and just started pulling everything. And that just doesn't pulling sound it good. All when apart. That stuff no, comes it was a nightmare. Down, and tink tink tink. Oh yeah, and uh, you've you've done a really good job editing sure. the, the podcast. Uh-huh. So when I like, if I have a freak out over my, uh, my I'm like, if I yell and I get into scary will, <laughs> um, angry will, I keep that from the public. I, I, uh, yeah, I shield uh, the public from that. Yes, right. That, that's the that's the outtakes. Uh, you're not allowed to share those. Nope. But anyway, you know, I was like, stop. And then they didn't stop. So Uh-oh. I was like, well, Uh-oh. I-, I used my scare the bear voice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you try to scare the bear off the trail voice. I was like, stop. You know, I can't you even do it. You became very large spike. and your arms oh, went yeah. up. And yeah. Uh, waving my arms. I was like, stop. You know, and smacking my hand on the. And this poor woman, I we've all made mistakes. Sure, yeah. Right. Yeah. We've all made a really, we've done bonehead plays. Yeah. In, in the past, and we've all done it, I've done it, and I'll do it again, but good God. Because all the other artists, they hear me yell from two blocks away, and they're like, oh, what's going on? Right. Nothing's going <laughs> to rally come the around, troops. around, like, like big crowd starts to circle oh, yeah. the wagons. And... It's nothing gravitates the crowd like that unless it's like free food uh-huh. uh, for a bunch of artists. Sure. But uh, yeah, it was pretty intense. So there for a minute, we stopped her before she started smashing oh. smashing glass, but oh, there was there's definitely some uh, tent damage. Yeah awning damage, yeah. stuff like that. But, mm. you know, nothing we can't figure out, right? Yeah. So um, shows, I haven't been at one for a while. I, I don't even remember what it's like anymore. So They're terrible. Oh, my they God. Just, they just, they, they just suck. really suck. <laughs> yeah, they're awful. <laughs> I, I mean, don't know why we do this. I've been like, I mean, this whole studio thing, I, I opened Pandora's box. I'm like, okay, I'm going to like fix my furnace. Well, in the process of fixing my furnace, I have to demolish my furnace and yeah. on the one hand, it is exhilarating because, I mean, you know, destroying stuff is fun, right? Sure. But sure. <laughs> then yeah, I kind of have to. Yeah. <laughs> it occurs to me, actually, as you start, I don't mean to, to derail you, but oh. it's like you're like a pregnant lady. It... You're like nesting. You know, you're taking care of all this stuff and you're building the yeah, crib and you're doing all this stuff so that it's all prepared when the baby comes. That's right. Well, and the baby is me. The baby is going to be me, everyone. So we all <laughs> we know, know that. We know, Douglas. We know. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So, I mean, I was getting my my stress anxiety out, you know, taking us apart and big heavy stuff on chain hoist, you know, slamming it together with sledgehammers and breaking it apart. But then there's that terrifying part, the realization it's, shit, man, I got to build this thing back up again, you know? (laughs) Yeah, with a deadline. It's crazy. But I've never built a furnace. I mean, I've repaired my furnace and I know how it all works, but building it from the ground up from them sending me the components, it was kind of daunting and heavy. And Yeah. But I'm so grateful I had a a support team. I had some of my old college buds from around here came and- came and helped me out and it wasn't nice. just the muscle that was the thing it was you know you got all four or five of us however many there were here you've got the well you know this happened to me about five years ago and have you ever considered doing it this way or that way so we oh, just man. had all these little tidbits to make sure i was, was doing that good? it right it was good no you liked that oh that would have made me insane well <laughs> i i, I hate advice i hate advice if you had to build like, a glass blowing furnace which costs more than a freaking you know tesla uh you uh, you'd take the advice because like for example i got to the end of building it and the whole chamber was shifted off about two inches so that okay. meant that when i went to slide the door to shut it the stopper kept the door from shutting and you can't just leave a 2000 degree oven two inches open so yeah. What are you going to do? I'm not going to tear the whole thing apart and rebuild it again. So got out the old saw and just start hacking away at part of the furnace so that I could shut the door. I mean, it's the whole problem solver thing that we do in this business. It's like you are standing up against a wall and you you punch through the wall and you figure out how to solve the problem, you know? Yeah. I, that reminds me uh, earlier uh, today, I was trying to open my yellow paint and I never use yellow. Yeah. So I had to... Yeah, I had to open it. So with my I, I was your my pinky teeth. out when you did that? <laughs> no, I used my teeth. Okay. It was fine. I got my. It was a, not a pinky out situation. <laughs> okay, but uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, it's not at all like opening my yellow paint. So I just want to thank Fred Kemmer and Nolan Prohaska and Polly Cut and Jim Engabretson. Your wisdom, your help, your muscle was 
extremely appreciated. So thank you so much, guys. Big shout out. Yeah, it's incredible to have good friends uh, when you need them. So uh, glad you had help out there. What else do we have on the docket, sir? What else do we have on the docket here? I have some cryptic notes from Will Armstrong, everyone. Um, uh. New show, new you. What does that mean, sir? Oh, my God. This was hilarious. Yeah. So uh, there's a little art show that happens in conjunction with the farmer's market down in Santa Fe Rail Yard. Oh, okay. And it actually attracts some really good artists. And my wife, uh, has been signed up to do them all summer long. And because we're, we've been in Minnesota, she hasn't been doing any of them. So oh. this past Saturday was her first one. And it's got some, um, like Allison Antelman, the art show artists will know her yeah, yeah. incredible jeweler uh, out there on the circuit as well. Love so her work. she is, yeah. is down the way and, and her lovely husband, Eric, who uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm very fond of those guys. Yeah. But they were down the way. So, I mean, it, it attracts really good artists, but it, it's, a, it's an art show. You set it up in the morning at start starting at, uh, I think, 8 o'clock, okay. and it runs till 2 p.m. 2. That's it. One day show in your town, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Isn't 2 and p.m. when things good. are, like, really supposed to be hopping, or is that... No, nope. you're packing it up. That's when the up. farmer's market closes and everybody leaves. Okay. So it's it's funny. Actually, the it could close at 1. The 1 to 2 is just almost like old home week, and the artists walk around and kick each other's tires and... Oh. Play grab ass. So, I mean, it's just kind of a, a fun well, you little neighborhood grab thing. ass. <laughs> Nobody plays grab ass. All right. Uh, you know, I'm, anyway, just nauseating banter. Nauseating. Once again. All right. So my point being, and this is what cracks me up. I mean, I've been doing full-time art shows since 2002. Right. right? Yeah. So this is my 20-year anniversary. Are you still a newbie? doing art shows. <laughs> Well, yes, right? That's exactly my point. You're you're taking the punchline, but my god, we're like they're like you have to pull in from this side and pull out of this side and pull out and and it's like, you know, there's so much experience between my wife and myself. I'm like, look, we got it. Yeah, there's right. no, you know, I'm not going to break any rules. I'm not going to try to do anything wrong. I was like, you know what? All of this stuff with pulling in in this direction and that direction I can get a jewelry booth on one hand truck. I'll dolly it out. I'm putting it in my truck, which is empty, which typically can hold three booths. I'm like, I'm just going to throw it in there. We got yelled at. Oh, boy. <laughs> we did. They were like, you're not allowed to walk across the street with this dolly. And blah, blah. I'm like, it was so funny. I felt like it was my first art show all over again. So you're always a noob. Always a noob. You go to a new show and you're you're always a noob. You you're the shiny little baby. Just and they thought I was just trying to get out of people's way and they're like, he's trying to break the rules. These new artists trying to break I'm like, I'm not trying to break the rules. I'm just trying to get out of the way. And nobody believed me. They just thought I was trying to get away with something. Well, they knew you were the camper trying to drive down a narrow well, not a narrow <laughs> walk. I'm shifty eyed, Douglas. <laughs> That's what it is. I'm shifty eyed. Well, I was gonna say about the the new thing. Have you ever done well? You're not a craft artist, so you haven't done this, but well, I've been one. some of those craft shows, you, you show up, at like, let's say ACC or whatever, and let's say you haven't exhibited for five years or something, and you always get the I'm new sign, right? Oh, yeah. And then you have to explain to everybody who walks in your booth, well, I, I'm new to this show. I'm not like a new artist, so... That's, uh, yeah. that's that's fun. That's uh, good times. Yeah, I, I don't know. You're always a noob. Always Douglas a noob. The noob. <laughs> yeah. All right. You know, I've got a uh, high anxiety as well right now. Okay. You know, nothing is set, and I hate mm -hmm. this time of year where nothing is set for 2023. Yeah. Um, I've gotten into one show and I'm not sure I can do it. Mm -hmm. Nothing on my calendar is set, and I just absolutely hate this time of year. So I do too. I um, hate the. Looking at the inbox and being like, okay, do we got a quick rush in and buy our booth or is this a show we're going to actually be able to do? Like, for example, we got into the Grove and I'd like to do the Grove and I was holding out hope I could do the Grove. I won't be ready for the Grove. So I had to hold out until the last, you know, till when they need to know for sure to put in my hmm. I'm sorry, I can't do it kind of thing. So sure. it's I, I totally get you trying to guess. What other puzzle pieces are going to fit into the schedule for the year? Yeah, when's the so you're you've, you're doing one foot, but when is the first time you'll be able to get out and do something? Do you know? Yeah, I don't know. What do you? I really don't. Okay. So yeah, well, well, that's the whole thing. It's it's how, what what can I commit to and when? And there's too many unknowns. Yeah. So I'd like to get a director on here and ask them this question. Sure. Um, when you know when, when I feel like when I'm pulling out of a show, I always write like a little thing. I'm like, well, I'm so sorry, and I I really hope to be able to exhibit there next year and uh, my it's apologies, just my circumstance sir. and my calendar and, and it's like 
there was this thing that happened a while back where artists, they just wanted to get an email that there's so much anxiety with the show. It's like, right. you know, the title of the email, it's like yes. a lot of these shows will bury the lead. I wonder if shows feel the same way we do, whether they just be like, withdraw, just a title, like no nicety, yes. just be like, withdraw. It's a, Forget it's it. the same I'm out. it's the same deal. I mean, artists would complain if it's too long and verbose or they're like or if it's too succinct and to the point. It's like they yeah. they rejected me in too cold and callous of a way. I mean, really, honestly, <laughs> by now, I really don't care if uh, you're in or you're out uh, is, yeah. is the heading and boom, you know, move on. Please. Yeah, there's a thing online about that whole and please fuck off. <laughs> You know, it's just PFO, like PFO, right? Or P PFO, PFO please. Yeah. I got my PFO. It's please, <laughs> please fuck off. Please don't, don't email me back. Don't ask for your scores. What are you going to do with your scores, by the way? What are you doing? Do you give a shit? It's like throwing a my, freaking card at a scores. board. I mean, okay, so this particular jury scored me this way. Next particular yeah. jury might score me that way. It's like I deuced the carpet. It's time to rub my own nose in it. You know, I just like grab myself by the back of the air and just rub my own wallow in my own shame and my misery. I don't need it. That, that's a pretty colorful image. <laughs> well, that's how I feel. I just, I don't want it. I just don't, I don't want my scores. There was a, we were talking a long time ago and I may have brought this up on the podcast before, but I've always thought it was fun. If, if like, ever, it seems like all the shows come out around the same time. It would be nice if they just, if they do like a zap conference right around that too and just have a big bar room filled with it's like an awards show okay. it's like yeah. here are people and then you've got like the losers lounge on the other side of there <laughs> it's like you go hang out in the losers lounge or you go up to your room and you're like i don't know yeah well hey i was um on social media this week you know our friend evan reinheimer does his youtube show oh yeah and Those he had a, a really interesting video he had brought something up that i found really interesting and that was a neighbor of his when they asked about his his art fair van they said that's for your art and he said yeah that's what i traveled art shows and he, they said well that must make you a really successful artist then mm. and so he went into the whole concept of you know, what makes us a successful artist? What is a successful artist? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've got my own criteria on, on what, what I think. Yeah, what you is know, it? We were talking about shows and, and you were talking about having a couple of really great ones. And, and I kind of, for me, I look at it as being able to hit those averages. I kind of have this average of how well I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And then I want to hit that average. And I said this last show too, whereas I want to have the confidence that I'll reasonably be able to put a good show season together. Right, right. And hit those, you know? So at the end of the day, it does come down to the financial stability or the financial sustainability of what you're creating. To, it's only money. It's all money. Yeah. It's all, as far as like successful artists and things like mm -hmm. that, I don't, yeah, it's all, it's, it's all money based. Yeah. But I mean, it's not totally money based because no. I could go sell hot dogs. Sure. You know? I could go set up a crab cake booth and I'd want to kill myself by the end of week two. Yeah. Or actually by the end of Saturday. I mean, like, I don't want to make any crab cakes. Well, so <laughs> you know, then the I'd... component of making what we want to make, saying what we want to say, and Absolutely. having it be well received and people throwing cash our way, right? Yeah. I mean, that's it, right? That's a, that, that's the big piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to pay my bills doing what I want. To yeah. Do. Well, the reason and I bring it up- talk to a reasonably few chuckleheads. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I the reason I bring it up is in this talk I had with Oliver Oliver Schnorr this week. You know, he's been an entrepreneur. He's done just what you said about the whole. You know, I could go sell crab cakes or hot dogs, or whatever. He didn't do that. He had a successful business where he made the money, but he didn't have that internal fulfillment. And it was when he got into this jewelry business and he was making his work and having it be well received and having it be self sustaining. That for him was like the pinnacle, and that was when he felt on top. Yeah, that's interesting. You yeah. know, I, I'm i glad Oliver still talks to me. You know, sometimes we have those shows, those shows where you are the hot thing. Uh -huh. And I had one of those in Chicago one year, the the first time that I'd met Oliver. Okay. And he was just having an okay show right across the street, but they had a front row seat to one of those shows where I just oh. was crushing it. I've... You know, I feel like you're selling like something major like every – 20, 15, 20 minutes. You're like, oh, here's another painting. Yeah. And he, he was like- I've, he, I've I, had that too, where you, then you look over and you 
the sour look, not of I hate you, but the look of disappointment <laughs> that it's not going well on the other no, side of the street, you know? You're being kind. I think he hated me. <laughs> There was that. another one. Yeah. That. No, I doubt it. Too. <laughs> we try to be happy for each other, but sometimes you're just like, I don't know. There was this one, I remember doing Dogwood for the first time, and this lady next to me, I haven't seen her since, but she was selling something, I don't know, a ceramic fish. You okay. know, just, but she was just hand over fist with these ceramic fish, just okay. all, all right. the stuff. And I was having a pretty decent weekend, and, and I liked, I like seeing that, seeing somebody else. I'm like, I love going to a show and realizing that, you know, there's an audience for what I have. There's an audience for what she brought. There's an audience for this. And then uh, this guy comes over to my, I can't remember the guy's name. Well, I'm not going to, I'm just getting ready to say something shitty, so I don't need to call him up. You don't need to point it out. Yeah. He's like, (laughs) how about you and me grab this booth and just throw it into the river? (laughs) <laughs> because like, he didn't like that because he those... didn't like her selling so many fish i'm oh. like how much buddy how does it affect him sh- yeah the fish market isn't cutting into whatever you got right you know? just let her peddle her stuff so, it doesn't matter absolutely like, there's yeah. enough for all of us there is room yeah yeah so she, she's moving a bunch of fish yeah all right well let's get into oliver you set it up and then i i digressed once again but let's uh That's... let's get right into the right right into the show well the thing i wanted to to kind of say to lead into it is you know he finds this career fulfillment with his jewelry and then to have a severe trauma happen and then to overcome that and come back stronger than before so i'm really excited for everyone to to hear what he has to say about about his journey me too All right, here is Oliver Schnorr from Naples, Florida. This episode of the Independent Artist Podcast is brought to you by Zap, the digital application service where artists and art festivals connect. You know, Doug, I was sitting down and talking with my wife yesterday. She had just come in from her studio and she was complaining. One of the big shows, they decided to do a do-it-yourself, reinvent the wheel application. Hate that. Hate that so much. Yeah, seriously. I mean, it's like typically an application that would take you two minutes on Zap. All of a sudden, it's going to take you an hour and a half to reformat all of your images to their specifications. It just made me think about how easy applying with Zap is. You just click a few buttons, you've got your 1920s all formatted, and you are good to go. Exactly. So I personally appreciate what Zap is doing, and thanks for not making us reinvent the wheel every single week like we used to have to do. All right, well, we are here with my good friend Oliver from Oliver Jewelry in Naples, Florida. How are you, my friend? Very well. Thank you for asking. And I hear you are awake, too. This is Early morning hours for the two of us. We are doing the early bird session here. So we've got our coffee and we're going to have a little coffee yeah, talk. <laughs> looking forward to it. <laughs> well, I want to start by saying a big congratulations. Last month was a big, exciting event for you and Oliver Jewelry. You could say that. You won best in show at a top show at the St. Louis Art Fair in Clayton, Missouri. It was definitely unexpected. It was a big honor. I'm still nurturing off of it, and I think I'm going to enjoy the whole situation for years to come. It was actually something very special for me. Well, I would agree it's unexpected, not because of the quality of your work, because you do produce top-notch work. Thank you. But what's unusual is how often do we ever see a jeweler take home the top prize at a top show like that? It doesn't happen very often. To be quite honest, any award at that show would have been just fine with me. You are invited next year. It would have been perfectly good. Yeah. The funny thing is the whole celebration took place in a big conference room with, you know, hundreds of artists there. And uh, one by one, those awards get read off. And I'm just sitting there wondering, you know, when when are they going to call me? They kind of were kind of gearing up to the highest award. And I'm just still sitting there and wondering if they forgot me or if this is a prank or anything. So if I'm understanding you right, you were given the personal invite, come to the ceremony. There, You might have an award coming. and That is, that is how St. Louis does it. Okay. They, they inform you that you won an award. They hang a flag that says award winner. Oh. And then they invite you to the artist break which by the way is awesome okay and so you have no idea what you won you only know that you will be awarded or honored in some sort of way and then basically all the artists are there and as you can imagine if there's free breakfast there's a whole bunch of us <laughs> like i said i mean they have they have lots of rewards i yeah. think maybe around 25 or something like well this. i want i want to speak to the mindset i mean i think we can all relate to the it's like they probably passed the best in 
jewelry category and then, you know, they keep moving on and you're thinking to yourself, wait, maybe they forgot me. Maybe this is a mistake. Never considering it was the top prize about to come your way. And that's exactly <laughs> what was going through my mind. I did not expect that Best in Show would be even a consideration, even though, I mean, don't get me wrong, I like my work. Yeah, and yeah. I think it, it, it deserves recognition. But at the St. Louis Art Fair, it's that much more special to have the very, very best artist there. And I think every artist that really shows at the show deserves an award because it's the best of the best. It's the, the quality of work is just amazing. And to be recognized best of show at that level of artistry and uh, it was just amazing. I'm sp still speechless right now thinking about it. It's pretty, it's pretty great. But there's more to it than just being recognized. I mean, it's almost like the past, I can't remember when this happened, but you were at your lowest of lows about three years ago when you had the accident. And then this is almost like coming back from that as as being better than before that, that is right uh, it, it that's kind of the curveball life throws at you and you know going through so i had a i had this injury in uh 2019 i mean i'd say even more than just an injury we think of like pulling a muscle as an injury i mean you had a very traumatic experience uh would you be interested in talking about that sure i mean like like i told you earlier i actually had sleepless nights preparing for this interview that we, we were planning to do, thinking about the whole situation, trying to figure out how I'm going to word it, uh, it make me live through this whole incident uh, or this whole ordeal, I should say. Incident sounds like a short right. period of time, but it really, you know, I mean, it's still affecting me today. And that kind of gave me sleep like no, sleepless nights. Sure. I can't talk about it. And I think it's good for me. It's something that's part of me now. So I don't hide it. I don't have a problem with sharing it with other people. If you want to talk about it and, and share that with uh, our artist community, I'm fine with that. Well, I remember back when this happened and I reached out right away and you, did. you were talking about the, the injury. You were talking about what happened with the saw. You said as jewelers, you kind of have to do makeshift tools and this was a situation that just went bad can you can you tell us what yeah, happened? i mean that's 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 basically how it worked uh, it was a beautiful morning may 3rd 2019 absolutely gorgeous day and i was motivated to get things done i think we just came back from a texas stretch of shows very successful shows had great great events lined up for the rest of the year we were kind of eager to make new and exciting work I do work that sometimes requires especially tools that are not sold over the counter or that you can't buy. So I buy existing tools, kind of modify them to my needs. Right. And uh, this was a wooden Dremel that you use for cuff making. Oh, okay. I misused a shop saw as a table saw. Somehow the the piece of wood got clogged in or got stuck in the saw and rolled my hand into the blade, which resulted in I almost cutting off my hand so i i remember you know, seeing the images it was like the saw blade went was it between the pointer finger and the middle finger or through the thumb and the, and the pointer finger right it, into the center of your hand it, yes it actually came right across starting at the knuckle of my index finger and ended up about at the other side of the hand at the bottom so basically i cut the bones of my index finger, middle finger, and ring finger, all the tendons and muscles that are associated with that functionality also got severed. And this was a table saw, you said, or a circular saw? There was, there was like a chop saw. So oh. um, basically, you're only supposed to cut through things with it. It has a cover on it, all those kind of things. I misused the saw, took the cover off and kind of used it as a table saw. So, you know, I am to blame for the incidents. And that's a whole different story. But it was stupidity on my part. And at the time when it happened, I never had pain, really. I was probably under shock. But okay. the whole situation was never really painful, even you know in the hospital thereafter and things like that. It was more a mental challenge. I really had difficulty at that point. I, I thought, you know, my life is over. It's not that going to – that's the wrong way of saying it, it – it's never going to be the well, same. Well, no, I mean, you you immediately, it hit you right off the bat that this was a life-changing event, that this was that's not correct. this yeah. was not just like a, a little injury. This was life-changing. It was. I mean, just looking at the 
traumatic injury that I had, you realize this is not just a cut. There is something major going wrong. And I wasn't really aware of the extent of it at the time. It was just bleeding profusely. I know there was major damage, but I I didn't know that the surgery had to be as comprehensive and that the recovery would have, would have been so hard and, and yeah. long term. I can relate to the shock you're talking about because on a much more minor scale, uh, there was a, a time years ago where I tore a hamstring and the sound yeah. of that muscle ripping was yeah. like basically like somebody just took a pair of jeans and just ripped them apart. And that's like actually what I thought had happened except for the fact that my, my leg wouldn't yeah. move. And there was that weird kind of shock that you go through like What's going on? Why can't I physically move? I'm sort of like looking at the hand with the saw blade and it going, uh, this is yeah. bad. This <laughs> is really bad. So what did you do? What did you do um, right after the injury yeah, so, happened? Uh, Christiana, my wife, was upstairs. And I don't know if she already heard by me possibly screaming or, or making unusual noises that there's something <laughs> yeah. not right. But all I remember is uh, looking at the hand oh my God. and then wanting it to be fixed right away. That was kind of stuck in my head later on too. You know, I wanted this to be patched up again and, and functional again. That was kind of the the, the immediate thought. Like, and I don't have thought. time for this. I've got shows coming up. I've got right, plans. Yeah, it, yeah. So suddenly all of that gets pushed to the wayside and yeah. you have to like deal with reality. Yeah. I mean, I think those thoughts sunk in a lot later. I mean, of course, life changing. I was aware of that, but kind of how it's going to affect my life and what I might be doing or not be doing, those things kind of sink in later. So my first reaction was run up, you know, blood everywhere. You know, telling Christiana call nine one one, kind of call nine one one. I need an ambulance, and we live very close to a hospital here, which is kind of good. But it turns out that I needed to be transferred to Bradenton, which is about two two and a half hours north really? from here. So they picked me just up just because locally they didn't have the the ability to manage what injury you had. Yeah, I think that this is like microsurgery, and mm -hmm. there is doctors or physicians that specialize in dealing with something like this. And none of the hospitals had personnel and staff that is experienced enough to to deal with the injury that I had. It, a little hazy, kind of what happened. Right. Well, of that, course, yeah. Basically, so they took an initial look at it. Once they realized, well, we can't handle the situation here, they kind of called around to the, the stage to see if there is anybody or any hospital that could you know, help me. And they found one in Miami or South Miami and one in Braided. And, and I ended up in Braided. Not that that was up to my choice, but that's kind of how it happened. That's where they sent and, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So then, you know, in a specialty transport ambulance, they kind of drove me up there, put me in the ER there. And then I was just sitting there and same thing that I said earlier. It was like, why does nobody come and see me? I I want this fixed up. I want this to be patched up again. Like it wasn't going, it wasn't going fast enough. Fast like you're enough, you're, no. you're like trying to like this is an emergency. Yeah. Why isn't anybody yeah. helping me as quickly yeah. as they do? They should. Yeah. yeah so okay. at the time, of course, I, I this is some this is the first time ever that I had something broken or a, a major cut or anything. So I have no hospital experience whatsoever. Oh, so you. <laughs> You just went full on with that one. Correct. Right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. If I do it, I do something right. <laughs> oh, um, God. Yeah, I know. So basically, I ended up sitting there or being in the in that hospital before I got into surgery for four days. Mm. They actually said that the swelling and the injury needs to kind of subside or the, the swelling for a successful surgery to take place. And I never saw really, or at least I'm not aware that, that the actual operating physician looked at me until the day before, you know, just briefly came in, looked at the injury and said, he's ready now. Okay. I think the surgery took like six or seven hours later. I was kind of patched up with a whole bunch of, of pins in my hand and things like that. Right. But funny thing is that, oh, it's not funny, but Ironic. I mean, the whole time <laughs> while, I, while I was, I was sitting there in that hospital room. Like I said, I really had no pain, but every three to four hours, nurses would come by and check your blood pressure and your oxygen level and all those kind of things. And one of the questions they would ask is, so how's your pain level from uh, uh, zero to five or whatever? And even though I had no pain, I didn't want to confront the reality and, and deal with the situation. So I always said my pain level is five. Oh. I needed this 
you know, just to be subdued in some way, not to right, not, not to, to have a panic it. attack right, or right. not to just go down that deep spiral. You needed to kind of keep it all together. It's it's so weird that the physical injury is one thing, but your mind is such a powerful part of you that I think I had more problems dealing with it up here in my head rather than the the actual physical injury for, for at that period of time at least that's kind of what what went through me that makes um, a lot of sense the episode that was released last uh, was with Anthony Hansen yeah and will and Anthony talk about the chronic pain Anthony went through and will had also a ruptured Achilles and he talked yeah, about right. something that I hadn't experienced before I hadn't heard before. And that was this feeling of feeling kind of claustrophobic in his own body, like the injury is in his leg and he's he's feeling like I can't escape this. It's I, I can't like right. take a break from it. It's it's right there. You know, is that what you're describing? That that kind of like needing um, to to that mentally check is out. The best way of putting it, that mentally checking out. If I would have been at that time thinking about all the repercussions and problems and and recovery and all those things that are involved after the fact, I probably would have gone nuts. Oh. I think that, you know, just being in a state where your mind isn't working at 100%, at least that helped me. I think that's the same thing that the body does initially when you have something like this. It puts you in like a shock mode, okay. which, uh, you know, probably at least has that, what's it called, that flight uh, mechanism. Right, the adrenaline response, yeah, the fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So where, you know, your mind is still working uh, at least at some level, but other things are blocked out, and pain is probably one of it. And so I needed to stay in that state for a little bit longer because it was just so traumatic. Oh, but that was only God. the first couple of days. So once I got through the surgery, you know, I was let go there. I mean, you only stay up to the surgery and then the surgery was done. I think I stayed one night for observation and then Christiana picked me up when we drove home. And then and you're kind of like on your own to kind of deal with what's next, right? Totally. I mean, they give you a little, you know, uh, introduction in what needs to be done. So one thing is, of course, your hand needs to be above your head at all times. So I kind of always looked like this very eager school kid with my hand up. On. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other thing I know about the two of you, you and Christiana, is you guys are very like, you're like meticulous and like, it's like, okay, if this is what I need to do to have the best possible outcome, I'm going to do that. I'm going to fully commit. And I'm going to also like research all this other stuff that kind of like can get me what I need to do. I mean, I, I can really see that you were trying to take control of the situation at some point and just and try and fix this problem. I definitely wanted to have the best outcome possible. And I mean, who wouldn't, of course, and, but yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, the, the interesting part of it is going into this, the surgeon at one point told me that his surgery was about 70% of the healing process and my physical recovery and all that kind of thing would be 30% to not 100%, but at least to functionality again. And at the time, I thought, I thought wow, you know, that's a lot. Okay. Now I almost think it's the other way around. It took me 70% of hard work and, you know, the surgery was like six, seven hours long. So, you know, where where does his 70% come from? Okay. So yeah. the the road to me actually being able to use my hand again was a lot harder than I anticipated. It takes so much more discipline than I ever had before. It takes so much yeah. more time and, you know, just the willingness. There's a lot of times where I could have just given up, but I think that the outcome would have been not satisfactory for me. You didn't accept that that was that you were now unable to work with your hands. Yeah. Yeah. You I made mean, the decision that you were going to push through that and and keep working it. Totally. I mean, so for the first six months after it, I couldn't really move the hand. So I still had the pins in there. The whole hand or the, everything needed to be kind of calmed down again, settled. The swelling needs to be go, going down. So there wasn't much physical therapy that I could have done initially. And, you know, all you do is kind of, you know, run around right. with your hand up. And I had those cubes. Uh, it's like a blue foam cube that has several holes in it that I can stick my hand in. And that, I, that way I can sleep with my hand over my heart. So, you know, this, this blue foam cube kind of became my buddy. <laughs> yeah. And so for the first, let's say two or three months, there was really nothing I can do other than cleaning the wound and just giving it a rest. So in the, in that early period when you couldn't 
really physically do anything to start on your recovery. I mean, how did you manage your mental health during that period? What did you I mean, do to kind of... I, well, there were dark times. <laughs> Trust I'm me. sure. Yeah. So at that point, it was really, I needed to deal with a situation. I needed to kind of maybe come to conclusion or to realize that my life won't be the same, that I might not be making jewelry again. I mean, I, I started to kind of try to write with my left hand. And I know that the body is pretty amazing and it can adjust to a lot of things. Yeah. And my injury is probably compared to other people's problems, just minute, but you know, it affected my life. I'm a hand crafter and not having your hands is kind of a difficult thing. Well, and I've known you for a long time and we've talked about the fact that you've had a a history, a background of being an entrepreneur and doing lots of other projects and just always kind of being a real business-minded person. But since you've been working as a, a fine craftsperson in jewelry, this is like this was like the pinnacle. This was like you had arrived at where you wanted to be, what you wanted to do. This was like fully realized. And then to kind of have that that threatened had to just really mess it's, with you. It's interesting that you bring that up. I what I do now and what I've done to that point as far as jewelry, being part of the artist community, having that business model of selling your, your work on art shows yeah. has been the most fulfilling thing in my life. Being an entrepreneur or, or trying to create a business in the past always was just about making money. So I was I was chasing a goal. I was never enjoying the journey. And the switch really came in my mind uh, for one, my wife is responsible for it. But mm. secondly, the, the fulfillment that I got out of what I do now, you know, making jewelry, seeing the customers that enjoy the work, being part of this family is, is something that where I realized, yeah, I enjoy the journey. I enjoy every day. I, I don't, I'm not chasing a goal. You're um, not getting up every day and going to work out of some necessity to pay your no. bills. You're getting up to kind of fulfill your dream and your passion. Totally fulfilled. I mean, you know, I make a good living with what we are doing and I enjoy it. So it can't be better. And the rug was kind of pulled underneath my feet when where that injury happened. I, I was afraid that 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 might go away. Right. Roller coaster ride. I mean, within that time, I had highs too, and I had lo the lowest lows that I probably ever went through. I think it changed my character. I'm I'm a different person now than I was before. How so? Much more disciplined. I mean, the whole the whole idea of you know having to exercise your hand. I did it several hours a day, and just trying to grab on to, to your life as it was makes you different. It gives you a different mindset. Appreciation, uh, humbling too. I mean, there's so many aspects that I took for granted initially. and now Like how quickly things can change. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's not a given that, that everything is just going to stay at the state that it's at, you know? That's extremely scary. Uh, I mean, seriously, an incident that takes less than a second can change your life forever. And th that realization is pretty stunning but it can happen to anybody and it does all the, all the time all over the world so well, this is kind of a sensitive topic and i i know one of the things that I, when i first talked to you after it happened and I, it left me feeling a little helpless is is that idea of blame i mean something that happens in a second and i remember you saying I, I totally caused this for myself and, and feeling responsible and, and kind of getting over the shame of of causing it. I mean, was that part of the mental part uh, of it, it was for more you? stupidity. You know, I, I'm the person that not necessarily feels blame for the actions that I do. I think I, I behave pretty well towards others and towards myself. So blame is probably not the right word. I just remember feeling like, oh, I wish I could lift that burden from oh, you, which you. I'm sure it's a normal burden right. for all right. of us. I, mean. I, I think for myself, I just felt stupid, you know, to even attempt this. Mm. Before that, like I said, I've never had an injury or anything that had me end up in the hospital. And I felt invincible. I never thought that that could happen to me. And, you know, just be, oh. by not being careful or overly confident, it, to call yeah. something like this just ended up in me being disappointed in, in my decision making. Mm -hmm. It was super stupid. So it's not going to happen again. <laughs> but, well, how did how did you lean on on others to kind of get through that? Like what, what kind of support system did you have? You know, I mean, my wife is great. Without her, I... You I'm going to go on record to say she is. Yeah, She's amazing. Yeah. So <laughs> without her, there would have 
a lot of things in my life wouldn't be as smooth running and as good and as nice and as fulfilling and and warm as they are. So, and this was no different. So she really gave me everything that I needed in order to recover. And that is, like you said, initially the the research of what what this whole injury involves and everything that can be done, can be purchased, can be consulted. Anti-inflammatory vitamins or (laughs) anything like that. She was on the ball with it. Having that is, of course, really, really nice. And our neighbors here are great too. So, you know, I got flowers and soup. People came out of the woods that I usually don't interact with that much and and showed their, their concern. That was really nice. So this is just in our area here. But beyond that, I mean, you know, you reached out right away. Of course, my family was in a shock, but there were so many friends in the artist community that contacted yeah. me and expressed their concerns and you know, were hoping that I heal up really quick. Again, another one thing that I take for granted that I really never see, you know, like everybody, but I never thought that they, you know, think about me. They take the time to contact me and let me know that they hope that everything is going to be good. That, uh, it's very special. Mm-hmm. It's a strange business we're in. I mean, we kind of take for granted those relationships on the road. We know, oh, we're going to be in this city next month and we're going to see 200 of our closest friends. But maybe the day to day, we're not interacting as much, but we just know that that friendship exists and it's going to be there when we show up there. So for it to kind of exist in your own life after this happens and people reach out to you, it's got to feel overwhelming. Totally, totally. totally. I mean, you know, that that kind of... Well, one thing that, of course, is involved in this injury is, uh, you know, hopefully you have good health insurance and, you know, hopefully you have a way to pay for it because those Mm, bills were pretty high. And there is a lot of therapy and things that I needed to have. And those are not necessarily covered by any insurance. So we did like a crowdfunding or uh, like GoFundMe or whatever it's called. Right. And we actually had so many people contributing to my medical bills that despite of the well wishes, people actually went. Ponied up financial and, and, support. And that was that was another very humbling uh, realization that people go out of their way to help another artist, another family member. That was great. And it certainly did help. I took a lot of physical therapy. It certainly, you know, that aided me in my recovery quite a bit. Well, the outpouring of love is that empathy, is that knowing that people that care. Okay. But that also, the GoFundMe that helped with the bills, it had to take at least of all the stresses you've got dealing with, it can help lessen the stress of that financial burden so you can focus just like on what is important, which is healing and getting better. It, it does. It, it was very, very amazing that people went out of a way and they have no idea how much it helped me. That's Being cool. thought of this kind of like kiss on the on the head people think about you it helps you it gives you strength it gives you a motivation it's a very powerful gesture that helped me wow so once you were able to start physically doing the exercises and after surgery and when when you could actually start doing stuff how did that change things for you um to to the positive you know the thing is once you realize well there is improvement and it was the minutest things. I mean, you know, just being able to kind of wiggle your finger a few millimeters was progress for me and kind of gave me frustration on one end because it took so long, but hope on the other because I saw that I can control my fingers again and they weren't completely stiff. You could start measuring some benchmarks right. and, and right. noting yeah. progress. I mean, the, the physical therapy, like I said, where I went to here in the United States actually helped quite a bit. But I went to Europe to visit family. Because you, you have dual citizenship. You're originally from, from Germany, from Germany, right? That's right, yeah. And my parents at the time lived in Spain and so do my in-laws. Okay. So we went to Spain and I saw a physical therapist there that talking about pain. I said, I never had pain until, until that day that guy yeah. stretched my hand. Like you wouldn't believe it. It's totally incredible. And he pushed me to the limit where I thought I, he's going to break something. I, you know, he's going to pull okay. a, a tendon or break a bone. And I thought, what is he doing? But I needed that. So that guy really showed me the limits. All the things that I had here was like picking up cards or, you know, fine motor skills yeah, kind yeah. of and thing. That didn't really tell me where I need to push myself in order to really improve or go to the limit. So Harald Neuden is his name, big shout out. Okay. That guy 
change my recovery process. Um, well, was there an aspect of, so you're doing all the fine motor skills from your physical therapy in the U.S. Is there a little bit of like, you've gone through this trauma. It's like you feel broken. He kind of manhandles it and moves your hand around where you're thinking, I can actually be that rough with it and I'm not going to break myself again. That's exactly it. You you are so careful with it because you don't want to re-injure it or do anything like that, mm -hmm. that you yourself would never push it that far. So having somebody that has the understanding of what is possible and at what healing stage you are and showing you exactly where you need to take this if you want extreme recovery, then you know that needs to be done. I, I myself yeah. would have never done this. Uh, having him actually show me the ropes was really helpful. And after that, I took it to another extreme. And I think from that point on, the recovery really, really took off. I mean, now I'm I'm actually able to do everything that I was able to do before. The hand mm -hmm. doesn't look as pretty anymore. Uh, uh, but well, you're not modeling your jewelry uh, with no, your hand right. there, yeah. uh, Oliver. So it doesn't need to be pretty. I always <laughs> wanted to the hands to make um, <laughs> And so there are limitations, but not they are more aesthetically rather than functionality wise. So okay. I picked up yeah. playing the guitar, finger picking guitar, because okay. I always thought, okay, you have the isolation of each finger where you need to, you need to put pressure on each finger individually. That helped me tremendously too. So Howard Nolan with the physical therapy yeah. and playing guitar really changed my, my trajectory as far as recovery is concerned. Well, I'm sure the guitar was a twofold thing. Obviously it's the physical fine motor skills, but then you just can connect to the music and relieve some of that pent up stress and just create. And, totally. And yeah, it's enjoy. a great instrument that, like you said, and it's not just a physical exercise, but it helps you relax and soothe and just enjoy yeah. yourself that you know what you create that you were like you know kind of coming back from it i mean you were you were to a point where you could make jewelry again and you were ready to kind of resume that life that had been taken away from you and then you get that one two punch then we have covid happen so it's just like it seems like in your recovery maybe <laughs> on the one hand you were making great physical strides but it's like the universe was not playing along for you it certainly wasn't my injury was something that was in my microcosmos that was me and nobody was really affected by it other than my close family but yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm actually at the point where I thought there's light at the end of the tunnel. I can make it. Life hasn't been rearranged to a point where I can't make jewelry anymore. And I was really, really excited and happy and motivated. I had, you know, had a great show schedule ahead. And just like you mm. said, then all of a sudden we have COVID enter our lives, which changed it for so many of us. Yeah. And the whole mental roller coaster started all over again. So right. the, same, the same thing went through my mind, only that it was a little bit different level where our business model is not going to work anymore. People won't buy jewelry. Art shows won't be there anymore. It was so difficult to overcome one hurdle only to stand in front of a, a wall. And what seemed like an, yeah, an even bigger hurdle. And yeah. that I, yeah. I don't think we should forget the fact that we didn't know what the outcome was going to be with this virus. In the middle of it, it felt like, you're right, is this industry now dead? Is this doing things in person? Is this a thing of the past? Are we going to have to recreate how we make a living or how we express I ourselves? I certainly do think that way. Like I think so many of us, especially in our medium, jewelry, I was always thinking, okay, people wearing masks, how are they going to judge their their aesthetic with the face covering when they try on earrings or a necklace. You know, if you uh, if you sell 2D work or wall hangings or, or you know sculptures, it's not as um, personal. Personal, yes, as as jewelry is. So I, especially for my medium, I was very concerned that it might have negative effects. Definitely. Wow, I didn't think of it like so that. Definitely. It's interesting how you have so many situations that tell you or that try to tell you one thing. And then and we talked about it in our kind of prelude when we preparing for this. And then I end up winning an award that means so much to me. I have such a successful year. That's so if it would be up to me, pessimism would, would survive probably or, or, or win because I thought, you know, this is not going to end well. And life proved me wrong. It ended up better than I could expect. And that's mm -hmm. not just financially, that's me personally. Um, and, and everything in my life actually turned out to be good.
I mean, I don't like COVID. <laughs> I don't like what it does to us. But it didn't yeah. end my life. So okay. I have to say, with what I'm going through with my with my ankle, it is hard to feel like there's better days ahead. That this isn't just like this is the new normal, or oh, now I can't do what I would want to do. So to have that realization that you could come back from something as severe and traumatic as that, and just on top of the world, yeah, basically. Uh, I mean, I feel for you, and I'm sorry what what you're going through, and you know, half ahead of you. But yes, keep in mind that you are in control, and you can change your future. And if you work hard on recovery and those kind of things, there will be improvement, and life goes on. We are very re resilient. If you don't give up, you will come out right. better on the end. In the end, at least yeah. that's my. And I had many hurts in the past. <laughs> well, we've talked about uh, Christiana Hampel, your wife, how she has been your rock. And, and you guys have this really great relationship. And, you know, just getting to know you over the years, it's really interesting that I don't know if everybody knows this, but when you met her, she's the jeweler. She was a, the jeweler in Germany who kind of taught you everything you know, right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. She pulled me out of this hunt, this chase of financial success and put me on the path mm. of daily fulfillment that I feel now. Yeah. So when, when we met, I had actually a sign business. I uh, did graphic design and signage for the housing market here in South Florida. I like the whole jewelry idea. We did a few small shows here and there in the local area. And was that selling her work or was this work? work? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I was tent monkey at the time. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's responsible of setting everything up. And then, you know, she did her thing. And I kind of, you know, kind of enjoyed it. I've been to art shows before prior to that, but I've never sat on the other side, so to speak. Right. So I kind of enjoyed the process. And in 2007, 2008 or somewhere around there, when that housing market completely crashed, most of my customers went away. They filed for bankruptcy or they downscaled, and my business was kind of at a standstill. No one needed signs back then? <laughs> yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. Well, I, I was not motivated to chase the small accounts because I really established a well-run well, well -run business at the time, and I didn't want to start from scratch right. again. And so sure. we kind of thought, you know, how about we, we try jewelry full-time? And it was a rocky road. I mean, initially, you know, we didn't make much money with it. We can hardly pay the bills. It, of course, meant that I needed to delve more into the whole process, you know, not just from the business side of use, so selling the work, but also making it. Getting into the medium of jewelry, it is a difficult market for one, just the number of people who identify themselves as jewelers and apply to these fine fine art shows, right? I mean, so did you kind of have to find your way in through that as well? Yes. I mean, I think that's part of the growth that you have if you are in, in our industry, so to speak. I think that you need to figure out your own way. Jewelry, of course, is a highly competitive medium, and it's so diluted, unfortunately, which is a curse, but it also allows you or gives you the need to stand out. And I think that that highly competitive industry or market or medium really pushed me to create something that's recognizable, has its unique voice, stands out, is you know, a one-off. It's something very special. So I do like that because of it. But of course, there's many things that influence the jewelry category that are not very likable. Mm -hmm. One positive is definitely that it pushed me to the next level. It always does. I mean, I, I always want to create something better and greater and, and more unique. So I think that mm -hmm. it gave me opportunity. You know, when you start at a time where this application wasn't around and, you know, you had to mail in your slides and all that kind of stuff, it wasn't really that apparent then. And, you know, we learned right. by, by going to art shows, talking to different artists, you know, figuring things out that way. And then there's kind of at one point that mm -hmm. art, art for a source book came out and about. And he was like, oh, this is a holy grail. So, you know, all the art shows where to apply to and how to do it. Uh, now with this application, uh, I think that's even 
more complicated, more complex, more competitive for every medium because now everybody's applying to every show at any given day. And, uh, you know, it's uh, if you have 2,000 applications for 200 spots at, at a top show, that's, that's high competition and tough to get in. Yeah. Would you say that you bring to your the jewelry business that you stepped into kind of the the learning curve of being an entrepreneur and how to make something that stands out and and the kind of the business side of things that that helped it, you find your it, way into the market it definitely did there's two different things that i think are important for me one is i'm not traditionally trained which doesn't give you that that tunnel vision you know mm-hmm. it allows you to think outside the box i think so that helps the creativity aspect of it, I think, because I'm not bound by what people say you can or cannot do. Mm-hmm. So creatively, I think that really helps. And from the business point of view, yes, I think that if you have a sense of how you can sell something and you know how you can talk to a person, it really does help to sell something. So I think that's we are in such a multi-tier mm-hmm complex environment where you need to be creative and create unique work you know you need to have the time to do that but then you're also your own salesperson you you oh yeah the shop so the job list goes on forever (laughs) right i mean you know people really would know what's involved i probably wouldn't enter this business but right well you you say that coming into it you bring this you don't have the baggage of being traditionally trained you know jewelry techniques but you do have that as a resource and at your disposal in your collaboration with with Christiana. So I guess the creative is wide open, but then when it comes to the technical, you guys can kind of lean on each other for that. Yeah. So jewelry is a very complex medium where many many people don't think about it. But you know, other than creating an, an attractive object, first of all, there's a lot of technical skill involved in actually doing it. But then on top, you have so many aspects of it. It needs to be weighted correctly. It needs to be aesthetically pleasing. It needs to be comfortable. It, you know, so if the person wears something, it becomes a whole different ball game. Then you know, I put this on on a pedestal or something like yeah, that. Yeah, or on a wall or something. Yeah, it's got to be correct. It's got to work into somebody's life. Correct. Going to a special yeah. event or whatever. It's got to be a, a form of self expression uh, versus you know something you show your friends when they come over for dinner. <laughs> yeah. so, so so this ad- additional complexity is something that a traditional jeweler is much more versed in in creating something like this. So initially my work was probably not weighted correctly or it didn't feel good when you wear it. And so, you know, those things really are something that you either learn the hard way and it takes a long time or you have somebody that actually tells you how to do it. Christiane is an amazing jeweler skill level over the top. So having her in this really helped. And initially, of course, you know, I was I was the helper. I yeah, I, I looked over her shoulders. Fifteen years later, she's has physical limitations. Making jewelry takes a toll on you physically. And for sure. my injured head, I can clinch a fist that is tighter than Christiana can with hers. So oh. you know, there's off. Because she's got some arthritis going Correct, on, right? Yes. So there, there's there's so many aspects of it that she kind of wanted to take a step back and gave me the presentation or, you know, put me on the pedestal. Yeah, you step into the spotlight. And Correct, yes. I want to talk about your work and talk about your designs. I was, you know, looking on your website and it sounds like what you describe about your work is that's kind of this combination of contemporary methods, you know, combined with traditional technique. What does that mean? You know, so jewelry making is an ever evolving industry. And I mean, as you see, you know, you, you pull out pretty amazing jewelry out of the tomb in old Egypt and you wonder how people have made, made those and their craftsmanship is impeccable. Mm. But with uh, today's mm-hmm. technologies, uh, it's, it's possible to use uh, CAD design, uh, 3D printing, scanning of objects that oh. you can then manipulate further into wearable art. So it would be, blind, you know, it wouldn't be the right thing not to explore and incorporate those technologies into the creation of work, because I am a big believer of the end result, not necessarily of the techniques that got you there. Yeah. 
If you can get to a place where something has never been seen before, that's the whole thing in this business is to stand out as unique. That is correct. So art should not be judged by how it's made, but what the end result looks like and what, what the effect that it has onto you. Uh, and I mean, of course, there's crafting involved in making jewelry, which is a category that is not necessarily completely considered art, which I don't agree with, but it, it is. Yeah. But we all use tools, you know, I mean, a painter mm -hmm. uses a brush and, you know, if they're advanced, maybe they do a little bit printing and enhancing and all those kind of things. So there's a lot of things that influence our work these days because of what technology allows us to do. I, I'm not shy of exploring those. Okay. I think that... Um, it, everybody should, uh, if if it's in their abilities. I heard this from somebody. Is this true that Germany is known for the trade of jewelry? That they have some of the best tools and. Um, I mean, I think that you know, craftsmanship in Germany was always a very high valued uh, profession. Mm -hmm. You know, it's every person in Germany used to be very well trained. The European Union kind of loosened the education system a little bit and the requirements to achieve certain levels of craftsmanship. Yes, you're right. In Germany, some of the gemologists and, and stone setters, and you know, they do great, amazing work that I've never seen anywhere else. It's just amazing how you once you put time into something how you get better and if you try yeah. to strive and create unique work you really see the journey and um you know i've been doing it for 15 years it's not that long of a journey but i can really see how it changed the work that i do and and the way that i approach things it's 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 a nice yeah. progression pretty interesting and i mean every experience you have up up until the day you decided to go down the jewelry route, those little bits and pieces also help shape who we are as independent artists and in with our work, with our designs, but then also in the overall business. You know, it it, it there is no wasted experience when it comes to creating. <laughs> you know what I mean? When it comes mm -hmm. to creating what we what we do, it is it's all an amalgamation of our life experiences. No, no, well put. And that's that's really what it is. And um, I think the, if the customer relates with that, and that's kind of what we have on our shows, you know, we, we, the customer gets to meet us and relates to us, the whole package then ends up being possibly a sale, you know, where the, they, they meet the individual, the artist, get a little bit of your experience, a little bit of your personality, and then they get to own something that you created. I think, um, you know, it's, it, that's special about our shows and the way that we sell our work. I like to create an aesthetic that is organic, but yet futuristic. So it has this melt of something that looks created by nature, but also is something, you know, somebody can wear and it looks attractive and contemporary mm -hmm. and, and modern. So a cat design initially had a big part when we first started out it kind of subsided a little bit now so my statement still talks about that but i think a combination of computer and and traditional making jewelry is what you see when you, when you look at my collections definitely and and also i mean that that influence of nature you're a scuba diver right so you've got some of your influences from the sea yeah that is correct i actually at one point in my life i wanted to make that a profession i i'm really? a dive master with the intention to become a, a dive instructor and then you know kind of life changed and I had different interests but i spent a lot of time underwater you know scuba diving was a big part of my life i don't dive anymore. I haven't in a while. I mean, I can always refresh it, but I haven't been in a long time. Okay. But the the inspirations or the memories, the visuals that I took from that time impact me today. I think it's such a different world and to really enter a different world. It's nothing that if you never stuck your head on that water on an ocean reef, you are missing out. Mm -hmm. So all the different shapes, uh, textures, and, and, and creatures that I encountered during that time initially worked themselves in the work unconsciously. I didn't really intend to do that as my theme. So the first few pieces that I did with that concept were experimental, but I, uh, it turns out that people really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And once I had that feedback, I made it my mission to use that as the inspiration for most of the pieces that I do. So I like microorganisms like viruses. I mean, you know, look at the coronavirus, the image that you see every once in a while. I think 
it's so cool. Yeah, right. Um, microorganisms and ocean-inspired creatures are is really what the center of my design philosophy. Well, you work with expensive materials. You're working in gold and, and jewels. And one thing I would anticipate is a little tricky with the, the creative process is taking a risk on making a design that you don't know how your collectors are going to respond and having so much money into that piece. It, it, it is something that I don't know it any other way. So it's it's normal for me that in jewelry or the jewelry that I make, you have a high investment in material. It's just it's just the mm -hmm. fact. So I've never been a painter. I've never had the luxury of buying a canvas for you know fairly little money. And I know paint can be expensive too, but you know overall it's nothing compared to mm -hmm. what you have to stick into a piece of jewelry. It's the uncertainty if somebody is going to like it. Yeah. But what I enjoyed and what I had the privilege really is that everything that I really put out there was enjoyed. Mm -hmm. So people like it. So, so the feedback was pretty immediate. Yeah, was, correct. Was, yeah. And was, it, yeah. yes. And, and that allowed me to, to stick to my philosophy and not deviating from the path to make something commercially interesting. Yeah. I can, I can always create something or at least I was lucky enough that everything that I created found a customer at one point or another. Well, speaking of commercially interesting, I guess thinking beyond just art shows, every retail center in a city, every mall has got a jewelry store. And so when you have a public that where jewelry is readily available, and then to come to an, a fine art show like that, that's another kind of specialized market or a specialized target of, of who you're trying to speak to. It is. Um, and I'm so blessed that that, that exists. Um, jewelry stores, I'm not a big friend of. Um, you know, Online sales don't really work for me. Social media, something that some people swear by, it doesn't work for me. So without art shows, it would be a big problem, really. Okay. I think that my customer, too, demographic-wise, is kind of, you know, in the, what's starting in the late 40s and then going upwards. So, you know, the, the new generation's Definitely not into jewelry that much, and not in in what I create at least. I think that you know there are some young people that are interested in it. Um, to get back to your question, um, the, the yeah, I mean the market is diluted to such an extent that you have all the cheap stuff that you or or not well made jewelry that can, yet you can buy in a mall kiosk or then right. you go one level up, you go to a mall store, or those kind of things. But it's all mass produced. It doesn't have to be aesthetic, I think, in most cases. I mean, there's beautiful jewelry here and there, but most of it is really for the mass market. It's not like sculpture for your personal aesthetic or your personal design that somebody would want to make a statement about themselves, what they want to express, as opposed to just like something shiny on their finger, you know? That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's a totally different customer. And um, the, the the person that buys Oliver Jewelry's jewelry is really somebody that is confident, is not brand oriented and wants to express themselves the way they like it. doesn't matter what their friends say. doesn't matter what their colleagues say. You know, that's them. And they either take it or leave it. It's something special, something unique. It's very fulfilling, I think, if somebody really expresses their personality with things that you create. It's special. And I'm blessed that we have art shows to, mm -hmm. for me to experience that because otherwise I, I wouldn't know how to do it. So everyone knows that working as a jeweler, you have that risk, that risk of theft, that, that risk to safety. And I don't want to out what you do specifically to protect yourselves or to be prepared, but I'm sure that the idea of, of being robbed it's always on your mind it's a subject that concerns me and that i think about every day and it's such an unfortunate part of making jewelry it's something that you can't really prepare for it happened to so many i think us we are just always very aware i'm always a prisoner of the art show so to speak i mean i never leave the booth or very seldomly i mm. i'm always on the lookout for people that you know, might not act or behave the way that they should on an art show. And we, I actually left an art show just during the show to pack up the entire thing we left. Because of safety? But yeah, I had such a bad feeling about one individual that was, it looked like they were checking the workout to be taken. 
and we just packed up and left the show. So that hyper vigilance, I mean, it's like on the one hand, you have to be carefree, not a worry in the world, interact with people, talk and have stories. But then in the back of your mind, you're thinking, is this person playing me? Is this, am I a mark? Yeah. You know what I it's, mean? It's, it, like I said, it's very sad that it happens, but it's part of I'm doing business, I guess. But it doesn't influence me that much that it cripples me. But at any given show, we don't socialize mm-hmm. much. I spend most of the time, other than small restroom breaks, at the booth. After the show, we hardly ever go out to dinner with, with friends and make it just about the fact of selling the work. And the socializing comes later. Yeah. That is because we want to protect our investment in our work. And that's smart. I mean, it's something that as a glass blower, I don't ever have to think about. Someone melted down my glass. They're not. They're going to get pennies on the dollar. But you melt down your designs, and it's uh, so. It's just something that not all of us think about. And and I know it's it's a conversation we've had with other jewelers where safety and it's 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 important. It's a very very it important yes. consideration. It's, it's very unfortunate that my medium comes with that it added you know security concern but uh, i wouldn't change it i mean i like what i do i wouldn't change you know anything about it uh, you just have to be aware and if you don't feel good about anything walk off walk away mm-hmm. you know follow those instincts now, right follow the yeah, instincts be, be smart and safe you know and protect your yourself before you protect your work well speaking of uh, the expensive materials if I understand correctly, don't most jewelers have a much smaller markup on what they're creating than, say, a painter or a glass blower or whatever? Like, you don't have that wiggle room for price negotiation. Is that true? No, that is true. That, that is too, absolutely true. Um, in the markup, especially if you go into the higher grade metals, gold, 18 carats, and things like that, I mean, you can't just go crazy in your pricing. So the markup is lower and I don't like haggling anyways. Right. So, I mean, I price the work fair and it's a leave it or love it situation. Yeah. I mean, most customers really are great and they don't haggle. Well, I, I know that we all, as in our medium, we have like someone will say, how long did that take you? And that's usually the kiss of death of them trying to, to get down to the, the brass tacks of how much money is in the piece that they're, they're purchasing. But I was in your, in your booth at Ann Arbor this year, and I heard the perfect response from you. You, you had a customer come in and ask you, how much is the gold worth that's, that's in this piece? And do you remember what your response to them was? I don't know. Did I say something like this that you'd pay for design and the material is free? Or? You did. It was so incredible. You're like, tell you what, don't even worry about the cost of gold. I'll throw that in for free if you're willing to pay me what I'm asking for the design yeah. of the piece. I mean, that was so choice. That wasn't off putting. It didn't send them away. They're kind of like, oh, oh, okay. Kind of reframe the conversation. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of refreshing that you actually experience the same thing. But it's, yeah, in, in jewelry, unfortunately your work is judged not only by the creative results that somebody sees in front of them but also by the value of material that goes into it and they have a perceived value too so if they perceive that they're spending a lot of money on something that has intrinsic value it it heightens the the desirability yeah it does it does i mean uh, you know in order to actually kind of answer that question for most people i always thought they're going to have the do-it-yourself kit you know like a piece of (laughs) Piece of metal, a file, and a flamethrower, and here you go. You know, try it yourself. Pull out a little piece of gold and put it on (laughs) on top of the thing. It's like, here you go. Here's the one thousand dollars worth of gold. Have at it. (laughs) Try, try, and if your if your result is not satisfactory, you come back to me and buy this piece. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. (laughs) Well, Oliver, I can't even believe it's been an entire hour. We've just kept on talk, talk, talking. It was just an easy conversation. We scratched the surface. There's so much more to talk about. Well, before we go, I want. Wanted to bring up the fact that you are in Naples, Florida. That's right. And Hurricane Ian just came through. Can you tell us what's going on down in Florida? Speaking of hurdles, right? Hey, yeah. yeah. Well, Naples is the windy city now. <laughs> okay. Oh. I lived here quite some time, and uh, we had in the last decade now we have a five year frequency. So Irma was the last one, which left the area quite devastated. We actually did the plaza in Kansas City, the, the show prior of the hurricane hitting here and we had flights to come down and put shutters up and secure the, the our home. Yeah. 
And then, and at first, it looked like it was going up to Tampa, St. Petersburg. So you weren't really in the in the line of absolutely fire. Absolutely right. So we checked the weather forecast on Sunday evening and see. Well, you know, it's going into Tampa, and it doesn't look like we should be concerned whatsoever. So we canceled those flights. And then, of course, you know, Monday morning we check again, and that wind took that easterly turn, heading right for our area, and that's how where it ended up. Mm. You know, the, the wind damage didn't seem to be that catastrophic. I, I actually feel that Irma did a much worse thing here. Nature looked like it was put through a blender. Whereas when we came back here now, two weeks after the fact, we still had one show and then came back mm. to Naples. It looked all very cleaned up until you reached the areas where flooding did a number on the houses. Oh. And unfortunately, the storm coincided with high tide so it pushed in a 10 foot uh, high tide into everything that is within let's say a mile off the beach but a lot of flooding Look, place so when you a mile yeah i mean that's hard to even it's like we talk about this and then to like actually process what a mile inland looks like it's, incre it's <laughs> oh incredible God. and i mean uh, you know so did that reach all the way to like to tamiami trail on yeah, 41 yeah. you if you see some images there that was all underwater that still has like three feet of water you know all across and three feet you can imagine that runs into the businesses and all the single story houses uh -huh. are down there so now if you drive through that area because people had to rip out all their belongings, the drywall, the carpeting, and everything is piled up in front of their houses. So it looks like the a war zone. I mean, it looks like a, okay. a tornado went through there, but it's all man-made and piled up there. It looks devastating. I mean, if you can just imagine the value and the that people lost, and then of course they, you know, the the fact that they have to rebuild their lives. It's incredible. I'm sure the contractors are just flocking to South Florida to to get some yeah. some jobs yeah. to to, to uh, fix them. So on the way on problems. the way down here, um, we we drove I-75 going south, and the, just what you said. I mean, there's so many individual contractors that you can really see. They kind of you know they piled their equipment up onto the truck and then just headed down here. And so we have that that contrast of the the oh. contractors going down to Naples, and we saw all the electric vehicles coming back. You know, the the bucket trucks and all that kind of stuff came towards us because they had so much repaired at that point. And then once we were closer to Naples, you had all those vehicles being trucked off that you know that got damaged because they stood under water yeah. for a couple of days for three to four feet so all the cars got damaged too and we saw those coming towards us well even things that we wouldn't expect like we planned on doing this talk a few days ago and something as simple as the internet connection was just crappy there was no way we could do this buffered conversation back and forth and until we could figure out a way to get a stronger signal but even something like wi-fi was affected down there yeah and it still is i think that if, if you prioritize it of course the water damage is the biggest one that yeah to the to the homes and, and people's houses um, the second one of course com is electricity so a lot of people were cut off by of electricity at fpl which is a local power company it did a pretty amazing job getting people back on i think there's a small percentage that's still three weeks after has no power but it, overall they did a pretty good job and then you know, what you said internet so telecommunication i think Utilities. some of the cell towers got damaged and on all, all those kind of things so it's quite mm. incredible how fast some of those things are put back into place. Mm. But then on the other side, we just, um, the Ritz Carlton here, just you know, not that I can afford to stay there, <laughs> but they just, they just said that they're going to open back up mid next year. Okay. So, so a major hotel, of course, they are right on the, on the beach, uh, you know, is not able to kind of push their repairs to be done by the end of the year so that they're ready for season. Right. Just because they want to get it fixed doesn't mean they can just like have it happen that there's going to be a, a rollout no. of when things can get fixed. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I mean, COVID and supply chain issues and all those kind of things play yeah. into this too. So, uh, you know, slot materials, they pro probably can't get that readily and, and things like that. So that that's going to be uh, tough for recovery and it's going to be a longer process for repairs. But like I said, I mean, this is just another hurdle. I mean, okay. for not necessarily the impact, the direct impact and damage that uh, the hurricane did to our own property, but there's yeah. a lot of 
tourists that can come into the area because, like I mentioned, the hotels aren't functional. Their snowbirds have to repair their their units before they can spend money on other spend things. their money on luxury items. You know, <laughs> and you know, we have the Florida season coming up. Yeah, and I think that the area might be impacted by it. But you're not going to go on uh, go on record I, as, as as gospel. But I mean that that would be the yeah. impression I'm sure from any anyone who who's standing down there looking around at what they're what they're seeing. Yeah, right. I mean, here's my personal take. I'm going to be pessimistic. I think it's not going to be great. But if all my pessimism learned me one lesson, it's going to be the other way around. People are going to flock out to the art shows. <laughs> they're going to, you know, they're going to visit the stores and they're going to spend money because they want to live and enjoy life. Well, your attitude got you through your trauma, so let's let's hope that a positive attitude will will get people through this one as well. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Yeah, I mean it's it's very sad, and the impact that it has, I think we're going to have to, decades of scars that we're going to see here. Oh. It really is going to take that long. Um, but overall, I mean, we're a very affluent area here. I think we're going to rebuild and recover quicker than most other areas. So, well, one last question here as we wrap up. I just wanted to ask you, with everything you've gone through in the past four years, all the ups and and the downs, do you have any like words of wisdom for somebody? Who might have been in a similar position as you, who had the rug pulled out from under them, what what they should kind of keep in mind. You know, I tried to address that earlier in our conversation. I think that the never give up uh, kind of attitude is what's needed. Mm-hmm. There's so many things in life that throws us back, and it seems actually last last decade it it accumulates. There is more and more negative and things happening that kind of affect our life. And you can't stick your head in, in the ground and say, you know, I'm not going to take this anymore, give up. But uh, don't. Mm-hmm. I, right. I am so surprised of how if you allow it to, it turns into something positive. And just keep working on what you're doing and, and enjoy the process. Don't chase a goal. Uh, and I think um, you, you will come out happy, strong, satisfied, fulfilled. Just keep living. Just and, keep living and striving and dreaming. Right. Yeah. If if your mind is, you know, if you have physical issues and you, your mind is down, you know, build yourself back up, have a positive outlook for the future. It, and you know, there's so, so many things that people are influenced by, but there's always light at the end of the tunnel and you should run towards it. Well, I'm going to keep that in mind because I, <laughs> I think by the time this airs or maybe shortly after, I'm going to be... They're going in and they're going to be working on my ankle. And I'm, I don't know. I, I'm going to try and take your advice, Oliver. I'm going to stay positive and hope for better days. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 and I feel for you, seriously. And I I, I will Thanks, support man. you every day. And like I said, if you need anything, I'm here for you. you let me I will know. do that. Thanks for this talk. Thanks for everything, Oliver. And I'm just so happy to have this conversation with you. I'm happy for the outcome that you've had with everything you've gone through. And, and thanks for sharing your very personal traumatic story. Of course, certainly. I actually, to be quite honest, I was a little disappointed that you never asked me before. I always said, you know, Doug, we are close friends. How come you never asked me for an interview? I thought, you know, it's like, am I a black sheep or what? Nope. It was in the it was in the back of my mind and it was it was all coming in due time. And, and a lot of these conversations we have, like, you know, like last episode, we talked with Anthony and my surgery's coming up, and it just kind of seemed like it was a good time to fit in and just have this. This talk, because it's so personal to me, this this project is so personal, and we go through things at different times, and our experiences are kind of lining up right here, and I thought this would make for a really good talk. Good. I'm, I'm glad it did. I think what you're doing with the podcast is absolutely amazing. It's a great addition oh, to what we need, and I'm glad that I could be part of it. So thanks thanks for making that. We appreciate you, Oliver. Thanks so much, man. Have a good one. Sure. Thank you. You too. Talk to you later. I loved your talk with Oliver Schnorr, Douglas. It was uh, it was eye opening. You know, it's it's funny. There's there's an element of that kind of trauma that you were talking about on the lead end. Mm-hmm. That's almost like you know we all care for it, our our fellows, but there's also a little bit of the you know oh my god, you roll the window down and look at the traffic accident. I was like that was a horrific accident that he he got in there yes. with his hand. But he kept moving forward, and I felt like his message for me, especially what I'm about to undergo here. Are you know, soon to know that there are better days ahead, to know that you can keep pushing forward and a positive outcome can come out of a shitty situation. So yeah. it was it was definitely inspirational to me. You know, I was thinking about your uh, your operation. You know, you why don't you get the one done 
you yeah. know, yeah. and then just chop the other one off and go peg leg. Jay McDougal style. Um, that is Plan B, actually. That's Plan <laughs> McDougal. <laughs> plan, plan McDougal. All right. Yeah, he'll carve you one. So I don't know that he'd be the best one. I, I'd just do a big old, like, just a, a one with flames. I want a hot rod one when, when I go peg leg. <laughs> That's what happens to me. All right, folks, uh, don't cut your own feet off. Uh, stick with us. We'll be back in a couple more weeks. We have some exciting things uh, planned coming down the pike. I've got some some good interviews that uh, I don't want to jinx just yet. So Gotcha. Let's... Cool. Well, uh, next episode, we will be entering a, a new chapter, a new phase into the podcast, and it's going to be titled Douglas on Painkillers. So... <laughs> oh, good. I'll drink some beers. I'll there drink... you go. <laughs> well, don't get addicted and uh, keep it on the straight and narrow. I won't. Uh, they only give you a certain number. You just got to be careful. We'll, All right. We'll trust Brene It's going to keep them. Yep. All right, brother. Good luck. All right, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you later. This podcast is brought to you by the National Association of Independent Artists. The website is naiaartists.org. Also sponsored by Zapplication. That's zapplication.org. And while you're at it, check out Will's website at willarmstrongart.com and my website at sigwithglass.com. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. 